car. Yeah, jump in the car. Come on. All right. Look, jump. Come on. Yo, get out. Get out. Get out. Get out. People in Henryville, make your plans now. You have only minutes to find your tornado safe place. The report's saying there's numerous rescue crews being dispatched to the Henryville area. And we understand that uh, Henryville's taking a second hit. March 2012, the start of spring for many in the United States. With spring, the severe weather risk was increased, but most severe weather outbreaks in March occur in the Deep South, referred to as Dixie Alley. However, on March 2nd and into the 3rd, a tornado outbreak would spawn 76 tornadoes across 13 different states, with Kentucky and the bordering states getting the worst of it. The most notable tornado of the event would track almost 50 miles through Indiana and Kentucky, leaving many towns in its path in ruins. The biggest and hardest hit would be Henryville, Indiana. In this video, we dive into the meteorological setup, the tornado, and its aftermath. February of 2012 had above average tornado activity with a total of 50 confirmed. While the first three weeks of the month were unusually quiet, the pattern abruptly changed with a major tornado outbreak, striking the region less than 72 hours prior to the eventual March 2nd outbreak, killing 15 people, including eight in Harrisburg, Illinois alone. On March 1st, a moderate risk of severe weather would be issued in the SPC's Day 2 outlook for a large area from near Tuscaloosa, Alabama to Dayton, Ohio, with the risk of intense tornadoes as an intense storm system tracked across the region in a very high shear environment. On March 2nd, the risk would be upgraded as a high risk of severe weather was introduced for Middle Tennessee and Central Kentucky, later extended into Central and Southern Indiana and Southern Ohio. On the morning of March 2, 2012, low pressure was centered over southern Missouri with a warm front reaching east into the Ohio Valley. By the morning, the low had deepened and moved into central Illinois. It had lifted the warm front out of Kentucky, putting southern Indiana and central Kentucky in the warm sector of the system. This would be the area of highest tornado activity. Extremely high wind shear was present across the region, with winds at the 500 millibar being in excess of 115 knots. The low-level jet across the region at the 850 millibar had winds in excess of 60 knots. Temperatures in the low 80s and dew points in the mid-60s accompanied the extreme wind shear. Cape values would remain low, however, with Cape values only reaching 2,000 joules per kilogram in the greatest areas. Despite having low Cape, the incredible wind shear values would cover the difference. PDS tornado watches would be issued early on the 2nd, as a round of storms soon to produce tornadoes would develop on the warm front. The outbreak is now underway. The outbreak began early in the morning as storms were initiating in front of the warm front tracking through Dixie Alley. Their first tornado of the day would be an EF3 that tracked through areas just north of Huntsville, Alabama, with the most intense damage occurring near Hazel Green, where several homes had roofs torn off and walls collapsed, and three were reduced to rubble. Shortly after, another EF3 would touch down in northeast portions of Chattanooga, Tennessee inflicting lots of EF3 damage before moving into Cleveland, Tennessee, inflicting more EF3 damage. 44 people would be injured. After several EF2s, EF1s, and EF0s would touch down, a tornado would touch down at 2.50 p.m. EST in Washington County. The tornado this day is known for has just begun. The tornado first touched down in the south side of Fredericksburg, Indiana, snapping trees at EF-1 strength along a narrow path as it moved to the northeast. Several minutes later, the tornado intensified to a high-end EF-2 as it destroyed a metal truss tower and snapped numerous trees. The tornado intensified further as it passed to the north of Palmyra, where it crossed State Route 135 and ripped six-inch thick slabs of asphalt off the roadway and tossed them up to 30 yards away. Smaller pieces of pavement were found up to a quarter mile away. Just beyond this point, the tornado began to widen, and tremendous tree damage was observed as the tornado tracked northeast. Homes in this area sustained damage ranging from EF2 to EF3 intensity. As it neared the south side of New Peckin, the tornado widened and strengthened even more. By this time, it had reached EF4 strength, with winds estimated at 170 miles per hour. The tornado clipped the southern fringes of town, and a large factory building was leveled to its foundation, with large amounts of debris swept away. 
Anchor bolts were bent at this location, and debris from the factory was scattered up to three quarters of a mile downwind. Nearby, an entire family of five was killed when their mobile home was obliterated. Several other homes and mobile homes were heavily damaged or destroyed in the New Pekin area as well. As it neared the Clark County border, the tornado produced high-end EF3 to EF4 strength damage to many homes and farmsteads as it traversed rural areas. One brick home at the top of a ridge was completely leveled, and a heavy trailer cab from this location was found a quarter mile away at the remains of another destroyed brick home. Several cows missing from this vicinity were never located. The tornado would continue to the northeast after weakening to EF3, completely leveling several homes near Daisy Hill. One man was killed in one of the mobile homes shortly after he recorded a video of the approaching tornado. As the tornado inflicted major tree damage, it reached the outskirts of Henryville, where it would destroy a home and scatter its remains over a large distance. As the tornado approached and crossed I-65, it re-strengthened the EF-4 intensity as it entered Henryville. The tornado ripped through the town of Henryville, resulting in devastating damage throughout the town. The Henryville school complex was in the process of dismissing as the tornado approached Henryville. The school would sustain EF-4 structural damage, including the destruction of its cafeteria. Most of the staff and students had already left the area by the time the tornado struck. Many cars in the school parking lot were thrown and destroyed, one of which had a wooden beam speared through its hood and out of its undercarriage. Security cameras located inside the school would capture a video of the tornado striking and destroying the school. The video will be linked in the description for those who want to watch it. Numerous homes in and around Henryville were destroyed, and some were flattened or swept from their foundations. The tornado was at its most intense stage when in the Henryville area, with the winds estimated at 175 miles per hour. Damage surveyors found evidence of very intense multiple vortices as the tornado entered the community. Massive deforestation occurred in heavily wooded areas around town, and debris from Henryville was found as far east as Ohio. After exiting Henryville, the tornado would take on a rope appearance and weaken down to EF1 strength. The tornado would then reacquire multi-vortex structure, re-strengthening the EF3 as it leveled a home and moved through Marysville, heavily damaging or destroying many of the structures in the small community. Several block foundation homes in town were swept away, with debris scattered through nearby farm fields. Damage surveyors in this area showed a complex damage pattern, with the evidence of sub-vortices developing well away from the main tornado damage path. Exiting Marysville, the tornado would leave cycloidal scouring marks in farm fields. The tornado then briefly entered Scott County, regaining EF4 intensity and killing a man in the complete destruction of his frame home. The tornado then moved into Jefferson County as an EF4. In Jefferson County, the tornado skirted the south edge of the small community of Chelsea, completely leveling several well-built homes. The tornado then narrowed and weakened the EF2 intensity and crossed into Trimble County, Kentucky, destroying barns, mobile homes, and downing many trees and power lines before dissipating near the town of Bedford, leaving 11 dead in the wake of its almost 50-mile-long path. Shortly after, another tornado would develop and hit previously affected areas in Henryville less than 30 minutes after the EF4 had gone through the town. Thankfully, the second tornado was much weaker and only caused minor EF1 tree and house damage in and around the previous affected areas. Many tornadoes would follow, including two EF3s, one of which would destroy a fire station, and the other would cut a path through Holton, Indiana, killing a three as it caused major damage to the small community. Another EF4 tornado would be born from the same supercell that spawned the Henryville EF4. It would go on to kill four and injure eight as it carved a short, yet violent path through Kentucky. Shortly after, an EF3 tornado would be born from the same supercell that produced the two previous EF4s. This tornado would track through Kentucky and Ohio at EF3 intensity, killing three and injuring 13. Another EF3 would track through Kentucky into West Virginia as it would rip directly through downtown West Liberty, Kentucky at EF3 strength, resulting in catastrophic damage. Massive structural damage occurred in downtown West Liberty, with many brick buildings and businesses being heavily damaged or destroyed and many vehicles being tossed against or crushed by falling structural debris. Every building in and around the downtown area sustained major damage. The tornado would kill 10 and injure 122 with its 165 mile per hour winds, one mile per hour short of EF4 intensity. Another EF3 would touch down in Kentucky to the south of the previous EF3 and would parallel it into West Virginia where it would dissipate, leaving two dead. 
Another tornado raided EF3 would touch down in Georgia and would collapse a house into its basement at EF3 intensity, injuring the man in the basement. The tornado would go on to destroy a total of 10 homes, leaving zero dead and one injured. Into the early morning hours of the 3rd, a final EF3 would touch down in Georgia, causing no injuries or fatalities. And with that, the outbreak was over. As people began to respond and assist to the affected areas, the devastation could be seen firsthand. The main point of interest for many, however, was Henryville, and rightfully so, as the devastation was truly incredible. However, despite the levels of damage, comparatively, it's surprising that only 11 people were killed along the whole tornado's path. Quote, it was a lucky day for Henryville, said Chief Deputy Scotty Maples with the Clark County Sheriff's Office. Quote, as we would go to house to house, we put an X on the door, if there was a door left, so somebody wouldn't search it again, showing there were no casualties in there. House by house, fortunately, we weren't finding any loss of life, he said. Others shared their horrific survival tales with the media days after the outbreak. A new pet gun resident began helping others recover lost items through a Facebook page called I Found Your Memory. Items such as high school diplomas were tossed as far away as Cincinnati. However, they were able to be returned through this page. After the EF4 that followed, the Henryville tornado had lifted and the storm moved into northern Kentucky. Debris from the tornado that was sucked into the storm's updraft began falling from the sky, causing the Cincinnati, Northern Kentucky, and International Airport to stop all flights for one hour. In the wake of the outbreak, it had knitted the affected communities tighter than they already were as they came together in rebuilding their home. A total of 76 tornadoes would touch down, consisting of 15 EF2s, 9 EF3s, and 2 EF4s. Those 76 tornadoes would leave 41 dead, 22 of which in Kentucky alone. Over $3.1 billion of damage was also inflicted by the tornadoes. If you did enjoy, consider liking and subscribing, as these videos, as always, take a lot of time to make. I also have a before-mentioned Discord server that you can join, link is in the description. And for the next video, expect something slightly different from the documentaries. I won't stop doing documentaries in the slightest, but I do want to explore some other forms of weather-related content. Anyways, goodbye, and thanks for watching.